So we're actually at the official starting time here. So um, I'm hoping that more people will be trickling in from break, but um, figure we might as well make the most of the time that we have and get started. Um, my name is Carolyn Cox, and I'm with the Center for Environmental Health in California. I'm also on the board of Beyond Pesticides and feel very honored that we have three really wonderful panelists lined up this afternoon. Um, so Ramon Ramirez is from Picun um, here in Oregon. Nelson Carrasquillo is from Cata in New Jersey. And Michael Sly from Rafi in North Carolina. Um, so we have a um, just amazing diversity of um, perspectives on um, promoting agriculture that's based in social justice. So what I wanted to do to start with was just have each of the three panelists talk for just a few minutes about their organization. Because if you haven't met them or their organizations, I think um, you will be um, impressed and inspired. Um, so, do you want to start, Ramon? First of all, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you for that um, introduction. My name is Ramon Ramirez. I'm president of uh, the Oregon Farm Worker Union, PECUN. Our name PECUN is a Spanish acronym for Northwest Tree Planters and Farm Workers United. And I want to welcome uh, everybody um, from outside of Oregon to our beautiful state. And, uh, and I just want to say that I'm really honored to share this panel with a longtime friend of mine and um, who I uh, consider to be one of the leaders in the farm worker movement around the country, Nelson Carrasquillo from Casa, from Cata. And I also want to acknowledge the presence of uh, a leader of the farm workers in the state of Florida. Uh, we have with us uh, Tirso Moreno uh, with the Farm Worker Association of Florida. A longtime friend uh, of ours, we've been working together at least I think for about 25 years or more um, on this issue of pesticides and also about social justice and worker rights issue, immigration included. Um, PECUN is uh, Oregon's Farm Worker Union. We were established, um, we started off as a, as a, a sort of a, a, a legal uh, community-based organization uh, fighting deportation and assisting immigrants uh, with immigration issues uh, back in 1977. And uh, by 1979, we formed what was the organizing committee um, to form a union. We had actually talked to Cesar Chavez back then to uh, see if he could send us some organizers. And he said, no, you guys are the perfect people to, to form the union in, in uh, Oregon. And, and he said he would help us, and he did. And in, 19, in 1985, we formed a union with about a uh, little over 100 workers uh, down in the Willamette Valley. And today we've, uh, we have a membership of over 6,000. And we're just, we're not a statewide organization or a statewide union. We're just concentrated in the Willamette Valley, which is uh, Marion and Polk Counties, which is uh, county I live in is Marion County is, um, is uh, the largest um, uh, um, agricultural uh, county in, in the state. So uh, I actually work in the heart of Oregon agriculture. We grow a lot of crops, we grow a lot of row crops. We have specialty crops um, like strawberries and caneberries. Uh, we have uh, blueberries. Uh, we have an up and coming uh, wine industry. Uh, and also uh, horticulture is really big in the state of Oregon and also reforestation and uh, forestry. Um, and that work is primarily done by uh, immigrant labor. We, um, uh, we primarily work on uh, on issues around uh, organizing uh, farm workers in their workplace. We uh, also, um, you know, we, our analysis is that to build real power with farm workers that, you know, we do it through a collective bargaining agreement. 
But uh, the the industry right now with uh, is really polarized. Um, unionization uh, uh, has not taken hold like we thought it would uh, because there's been a lot of grower resistance. And so we've had to develop alternative ways to uh, building a farm worker union. So over the last uh, 25 years, we've, we've uh, built 10 different organizations addressing uh, uh, the issues that farm workers, um, a farm worker needs. For example, we're into building farm worker housing. Uh, yesterday there was a tour um, of people that went down to, the, to Pecun and, and we start off at our housing project there. Uh, we also do, um, we do services, so we have a worker center uh, we're doing, we have a 24 hour radio station and uh, we've helped like build like literally 10 organizations. Um, but I think our most important thing that we're, that we've done lately is we built, we built the first green and passive uh, building in the state of Oregon in what's called the Capasas Leadership Institute, which is a center uh, that houses the 10 organizations to develop capacity and leadership development for the future generations of farm worker leaders and immigrant leaders in the state of Oregon. And we did it, we raised $750,000 in cash um, over a three year period during the height of the economic crisis in this country. And we did it by having organizing house meetings and we went to our friends for the first time we did fundraising efforts outside the state of Oregon. And we went as far away as New York, DC, the Bay Area, all over. And what we proved is that when you're doing successful organizing, people want to be what want to identify with that. And in addition to that, that was what we raised in cash. Um, but it took 1,500 volunteers to build that building, uh, including a lot of labor unions. The electricians send their um, their apprenticeship program uh, folks and helped us w wire the place. And we literally united the green movement with the farm worker movement. We even had the governor and his wife come down in, in, uh, on a couple of occasions to help build the Capacity Leadership Institute, and they had a major fundraiser for us here in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. And one of the things I think uh, that we're doing in the area of, uh, of worker, farm worker health and safety is um, we've been involved in the issues of pesticides for many, many years. Um, one of the things that's happening in Oregon is that 70% of the folks that pick um, the crops, piece rate crops in Oregon, that would be like strawberries, uh, that would be squash, that would be blueberries and cane berries. 70% of the workforce is indigenous, meaning that they're from either Mexico or Central America. And, we, and just in the town I live in, they speak 16 different languages. So the organizers that we've had to um, bring on to communicate with these workers are all indigenous workers. In fact, yesterday you heard from two of the women that, uh, that um, lead the, the pesticide project for, for Pecun. And so our, the, the thing that we're doing right now currently is working on, um, on building a uh, promoters program, promotores, to go into the farms and educate people around the, the use and dangers of pesticides. And we're doing it in a way that uh, we've been able to produce um, uh, materials in at least three different languages. We can't cover the whole 16, but we, we try to cover as much as we can and to, to educate folks. Currently, Pecun has uh, four different uh, collective bargaining agreements. We had nine at our, at our we've, we've had nine total, but we're down to about four right now. And of the four, three are, are organic, one's conventional. And so uh, the, the good thing about, uh, about the, um, having uh, uh, folks that are non-organic under contract is that in our contracts, we, uh, w uh, the growers have to give us um, the information about what's planted and what, what is planted and what is, what is applied, the pesticides that apply. And so we really, we literally get the list of, of, of chemicals, when it's sprayed, how much it's sprayed, um, and so then we were able to match that uh, with, um, with, uh, uh, with other farms in the area. And so what, we, what we've done is produce materials in three languages, Mixteco, Trique, and Zapoteco, to educate people that these are the types of pesticides that are being applied in your farms and that these are the dangers 
and and this is the way that you have to protect yourself at this point so it's a really exciting uh, project uh, we're, we're in our sixth year in, in doing this um, and so I think one of the the other things I want to mention is we're also part of of, of the Agri agricultural worker justice project um, in which I think uh, Nelson will talk a little bit uh, we've uh, we've sent our organized to get trained here uh, under that project we also um, um, are part of another effort um, called the equitable food initiative which is a, um, a multi-stakeholder initiative uh, that is uh, doing similar work as a uh, agricultural worker justice project um, but it's a uh, it's a little bit bigger it, it's really trying to um, get the large retailers involved in in making uh, in making a change in the way we do business in agriculture so we've developed standards um, we've developed um, uh, uh, you know procedures we're in uh, uh, we're about to certify we've got pilots going on and we're about to certify our first farm in the next couple of weeks and I think our two major breakthroughs on the uh, uh, equitable food initiative and if you on the uh, panel on the panel uh, literature table there's also materials on the um, on the EFI so we have a website um, but um, the, the major, um, I would say, centerpiece to those two projects that's different from all these uh, the other certification labels is that we have a really strong, uh, a really strong education component to it, and, uh, and we, we're engaged with some major retailers, uh, mainly uh, in Costco and with Bon Petit. So I'm going to stop here, and, um, and so thank you very much, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about uh, the other work that we're doing in terms of uh, worker justice. Thank you. Well, I, what I would like to do is, what I would like to do is begin talking a little bit about. Uh, some something I want to share with you. Uh, I grew up, and I don't really know why. I grew up believing that uh, that we were entitled to to education, uh, free education, and a free access to health. And believe me, I have uh, tried to reflect on that. Why do I have that belief uh, since a child? And, and I don't find any special uh, teaching from my parents or my family to highlight that. Uh, they, they didn't sat at us at the table and told us, this is the food that you have, and this is be uh, 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 happy that you have that food and that you're able to eat it. Because in, in my country, no, in Puerto Rico, uh, those years we were just coming out of a, a, a a, a, a time in which hunger was prevalent, and a time in which a, a, it was imperative to, to, to have food at the table. So maybe that's why the reason, no, I remember we all sitting on, at the table to eat together as a family, uh, the soup, the, the greens, and, and, the, and the rice and beans, and so on to eat it as a family. Maybe that's, that was why I grew up believing those things, no? So when I began to realize that that, was, that wasn't so, that, uh, that uh, there was a uh, hierarchies of education, hierarchies of, of access to healthcare, I could not understand that. Believe me, I, I was an adult, I was in my 20s, and I still do not understood that. Uh, I, I thought that, uh, well, how could this be? It took me years to understand the, the, the issue of uh, if you don't have the money, you cannot have access to adequate health care, no? And, and, and if you don't have the money to fight the food, but the, you're gonna go hungry. So that, turned, that to me uh, bec became the basis uh, to believe that uh, there was something wrong. 
because you, you see, I believe that uh, you, as a human being, we are all entitled to to have the best conditions that we need uh, that we ha should have. That the that by living in society, we should have a an agreement among us that as as part member of that society that uh, that the that all the energy and efforts will be the directed to provide the conditions so that we all of us can benefit from i grew up believing that and i did not have any reason to be, to uh, to believe uh, to the contrary uh, any reason to believe that uh, someone is better than i am or that someone is, is entitled to this and i am not entitled to that so I grew up like that, thinking that everybody was going to share that. And, I, and it was difficult to understand that uh, that wasn't the case. I remember as a child, I had a, 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 a three kings day, we, I, I, the gifts that my parents gave me. And this uh, young uh, child uh, asked me to, to if I could show them the gifts. Well, I, I, sh I showed it to them. <laughs> I was so surprised because they went running away. With the, with the gifts, and I stood there, you know, baffled. You know, what could they do there? No. Anyway, uh, I believe that we are as human beings, and uh, everything that is alive should be sharing. No, it's, it's for the better. We should not take advantage on anyone. So, because of that, uh, early on in my 17 year, more or less, I began doing. A community work in terms of uh, working with uh, communities around where I live, bringing Jews together as I was part of that of that group, and that has been my life uh, until today. Uh, so, acting together, no, in for a common goal, is a fundamental principle. Uh, uh, another principle is the belief that civil society responsibilities to facilitate that to happen. And anything that goes against that is against, goes against humanity. Goes against any kind of principle uh, of that. That's why I don't believe in democracy, for, by the way. This is an image. Uh, CATA is a farm worker organization. It's a migrant farm worker organization. Uh, it was created as a, a, a way to respond to the problems that the Puerto Ricans migrant farm workers were facing in the state of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, in the Northeast, Connecticut. Uh, they, uh, they, they would go and work the season. Mo many of them would return to the island, and they would not talk about the problems that they were facing. They would not mention anything, because it was a matter of shame. So what they would do, they would buy a, a suit, pants, white shoes, and they would return to their communities as if they were rich people. Right. Creating an image of something that was not consistent with what they were experiencing while working in the fields in the New Jersey. Right. And that con created a contrast. No? So for many years in the island, during the 50s, the 60s, uh, it wasn't known. People did not know about the issues or the problems that they were facing. And little by little, because uh, you don't live in isolation, no? uh, through the churches mainly, the stories began to come out. The stories, uh, little by, and people began to grow, have a little bit more of awareness about the things that were happening in the, in the fields, especially in New Jersey. No? So, so because of that, and because in the early 60s, there was a whole set of social movement going on uh, around several uh, issues, but, uh, that uh, consciousness became to transform into uh, uh, the mantra of we need to get the workers uh, organized. We need to get the farm workers uh, uh, in a mood to resist the abuses that they're facing in, in New Jersey, mostly. So eventually, the organization was created, and by the 1970s, more or less, uh, were, it was called the Association of Farm Workers. And it, it was able to organize 
2,000 farm workers eh, eh, in the state of Connecticut. Eh, what happened was, you see the, the long story when the really very, very short. <laughs> so what happened was that the, the, the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico dictated against the farm workers in, and in favor of the tobacco growers in Connecticut. And because of that, it uh, gave uh, the, the, the diesel, uh, dissolve the, 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 the association uh, of farm workers, ATA, no? at that time in 1979. And then in 1979, uh, uh, the group of, of workers in, in New Jersey uh, went, got into a room similar to this one and organized themselves into what is called now CATA. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I could that that uh, that's a matter. All that story of the of all those years is a matter of uh, of a book, no? Because all the tensions between the, the uh, what was happening was that the independence movement in the island was growing uh, during those years, and there was a, 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 a reality, a, an awareness that there was the need to to fight the uh, resist the colonial domination of the island. And one of the problems that we were having was that uh, in terms of, of uh, safety ball, was that the, a significant portion of the, uh, of the population was forced to move away from the island. So for example, today eight mo we are eight million. Four million of us live in the United States. And, they, and that number uh, during these years is increasing. So being and the numbers of migrant farm workers from of Puerto Rican origin are increasing as we speak in the last few years because of the economic crisis in, in the island. Well, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna stop it there and <laughs> but we I could go on and on. All right. trying to cede some of my time to these two gentlemen so that they could have more time to tell their stories. I, I haven't, okay, good, good, so. Well, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, really we uh, trace our roots back to the 1930s, uh, working on sharecropper movements. Uh, actually, we trace it back to Taranza, Arkansas, where black and white farmers were organizing uh, to be a, a union in the 1930s. And so these issues of, of workers and farmers organizing is, is, of course, a very old story and something that uh, must continue uh, today. Um, we, we gave this phrase to the AJP. This used to be our byline uh, for all who labor in agriculture, and we've, we've liked it so well we wanted to to give it a new life and we've given it to the Agricultural Justice Project because we think that really reflects what the idea behind this project is and, and the fact that uh, you can have workers and farmers and advocates and, and businesses all sitting down with a common goal of, of trying to model a different way, um, doing the impossible. And so that's really been kind of uh, our approach to it. Um, we do a lot of work with family farmers. Uh, in the 1980s, we set up uh, suicide prevention hotlines for all the farmers who were going out of business. We organized uh, stop sales. We marched on Washington. We uh, passed national legislation to change the Fair Credit, pass the Fair Credit Act. Uh, we created a national moratorium on farm foreclosures, something that the housing community did not take us up on. I think they should have in the recent uh, crisis, uh, but uh, very similar kind of circumstance where people went to the bank to borrow money and came home with more money than they asked for. Uh, only, but, However, only if you were a white male. If you were African American or a woman, you got denied and uh, they didn't get access to credit, and so we helped bring national lawsuits on their behalf to try to make uh, recompense. Unfortunately, in our opinion, much of that recompense came too little and too late. Uh, we still have issues with USDA today, but uh, we have to say it is better than it used to be. 
Um, but uh, I'm just honored to, to be in this project with Nelson, and, and I got to know Ramon's staff when uh, we were out here to do training on this project uh, last year, I believe it was, and uh, uh, have uh, uh, very encouraged to see that the national uh, workers uh, really organized a meeting of their own a couple of years ago and had a dialogue about what do workers in America think is fair trade? And we, we found that to be quite a problem, maybe a first, Nelson. And, and, and for them to be able to have it, and we said, okay, we're not, we're not even gonna come. We'll just stay out, you guys sort it out, tell us what you come out with. And uh, one of the things they came out with, which we you know, strongly support, is, is the fact that uh, you cannot have social justice if you're having to spray pesticides or you are being sprayed with pesticides. And I think that's, a, that's a, a something that I think is important to, for people to understand. And those of us who come out of farming families and, and have worked as farm workers as well, we, we know the circle of poison up close. I mean, it's, you know, if you're, if you're spraying a spray rig and you, you go down the field and you turn around and you're coming back up the field, well, the wind's gonna blow in your face then. And what was blowing behind you now is blowing in your face. And if you've ever tried to farm in, I used to farm in Florida in the wintertime because I, I couldn't get enough of farming. I thought, well, heck, I'll go down there and farm in the wintertime, you know. <laughs> so, you know, wearing a suit and all that mask is not that realistic, to be honest. And we also saw that the pesticide spray nozzles would clog. And you cannot take those things off with the gloves on. You got to take the gloves off to get the spray nozzle off, and then you you end up blowing the nozzles out with your mouth, okay? And we've seen the 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 you know the the farm workers spraying Paraquat barefoot and taking the the pesticide container home at night for drinking water for their family. The label just peels right off. So I mean these these this circle of poison is real. We know it's real. It is not necessary. And we have to really unite to change that paradigm and make the alternative the norm. So um, that's why we really launched into this with, with Nelson and with the other farm worker groups and working with Tierso and, and Pacoon to try and, and build this coalition that would really be able to signal that farmers and workers could work together. And if they could work together, then we can go and make that case. I mean, the fact that Whole Foods uh, has agreed to take this label on and make this one of their four labels that they're going to promote. They're, they're promoting biodynamic now, they're promoting organic, they're promoting non-GMO, and they're gonna promote uh, domestic fair trade. And so uh, we see that as a, a partnership that we wanna hold honest and accountable and are glad to have them uh, on board, we're trying to do the same with the co-op community as well. So uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that, and it'll be time for them to say some more. So thank you. So I'm just going to interject a few things here. Um, uh, first, um, maybe just kind of a little bit of an exciting announcement um, that. Tirso Moreno is here from the Florida Farm Workers Association, and he is very enthusiastically interested in being the co-sponsor of next year's uh, pesticide forum. So um, we're really hoping that next year this conference will be in Apopka, Florida, and um, uh, it's, I, I don't think it's official yet, but it's really exciting. <laughs> um, and then the, the next thing I wanted to say is just that, um, you know, we all have to eat, right? Food is not really optional. And there, there's something, at least for me, that's really frustrating and makes me angry when I think that People are being poisoned to produce the food that I eat. People are not being paid well to produce the food that I eat. Um, and people are living in um, bad conditions to produce the food that I eat. Um, and 
it's really exciting that there's some, you know, um, real progress that's happening that's going to um, make all that nightmare go away. Um, so there's kind of three different things, I think, that have come up today. Um, one is EFI, the Equitable Farming Initiative, which Ramon is very active in. And then um, the Agricultural Justice Project, um, which uh, Nelson and Michael are very active in, and that sort of partner thing um, that Michael talked about earlier, the Domestic Fair Trade Association. So what I'm hoping is that each of the three of them um, can talk about those projects and their respective roles in those projects and um, what what the goals are and, and what they're accomplishing. Um, and um, we'll try to keep that, you know, moving along so that there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, so uh, who would like to start? <laughs> I'll start. Can I, this, is this working? Okay. Um, you know, I just, I want to start by saying that I think some of the conditions um, that exist are, um, are really horrible in terms of, um, of exposure to pesticides. And just in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this area, um, like 15 miles uh, west of this area is an uh, area called Washington County. And it's, um, it's, it's known for its, um, for its berries. Uh, on the other, just uh, if you ever have a chance, if you're here, go, up, go down to Hood River uh, um, and go past the windsurfing stuff and you'll see that there's a large uh, agricultural community there. Um, and it's really beautiful. The uh, state of Oregon is really beautiful, but be, but beyond that, uh, there's um, there's a lot of there's a lot of horror stories. Um, I know that people talked about the conditions, but I just I just want to throw out a couple that um, that come to mind here to kind of lay the context for uh, the bigger frame of why we're doing the work that we're doing. Um, in the county that I live in, uh, you know the the statistics are are very much the same as uh, in the area that uh, Tearsall works in in Florida and Nelson works in in Pennsylvania and in Maryland and and also in um, uh, New Jersey is that you know farm workers suffer at least 25 percent more cancer rate than the general population right um, in our area uh, we had a local farm worker clinic uh, that had interns uh, a few years ago and they were seeing a rash of uh, miscarriages among farm worker women these are women that are picking uh, that were that are picking crops and so they started to do an informal non-scientific study of farm workers and determined that that the miscarriage rate among farm worker women for that particular county uh, was 50 percent higher than the general population of the county there's really something wrong with that picture the the bottom line is that there hasn't been a national study done on the long-term acute effect of the <coughs> of pesticides on farm workers, right? And even for the consuming public, for that matter. So we don't know. It would be absurd for us to say, well, that the, the fact that there's 50% higher miscarriages among farm worker women is related to pesticides because we don't have the scientific data. And so I think one of the things that we really got to work for um, um, long term is to pressure the US government um, because I, I really believe that the, when we talk about national security, right, um, it's all it's it's always has an immigration frame to it, right? Or you know we gotta we gotta create uh, different laws, or we gotta make the the border more uh, more uh, safer. We gotta we gotta militarize it so that you know we have control of people. But they they're really missing the point. I believe that the national security of this country is based on our ability to, pro to produce safe food. And so um, if, we don't, if we don't invest time in, in trying to figure out how this is going to affect us, I believe it's kind of like a, the nuclear effect. Uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen um, um, of all the, the recent activities going on uh, and our exposure to uh, radiation. But you know, sooner or later, it's going to hit us in the face. And I think one of the things that's missing from the debate is that national study. 
And, um, and now we're starting to advocate more and more um, of that. So that's one thing I wanted to address here, you know, that that is something that we need to do. The only thing that I can uh, um, uh, find recently, and that was like 13 years ago, was the Government Accounting's Office when they came up with a, their study in 2000, 13 years, 14 years ago, saying that 300,000 farm workers on a yearly basis are poisoned by pesticides. And that's unacceptable. And the other, the other, the other thing I want to mention is that in our state, we still have children working in the fields, right? This was a hotbed for the hot goods case uh, around the country where five growers um, were a fine by the by the U.S. Department of Labor, after after years and years in pressuring the the Department of Labor to come and do something about that, when they finally did that, there was a lot of commotion because they they find they found um, of uh, growers um, using children. That was one of the one of the reasons. There was also uh, wage violations, but you know children do not have immune systems, and. In the peace rate crops that I was talking about, six to eight percent still are working in the fields with no immune uh, protection, and we don't even know what's going to happen to those kids when they're when they're a lot older. So that that makes our work a lot um, more important. The work that the Agricultural um, Justice Project is doing, and the work that EFI is doing, because. You know, we're kind of like the front lines of the struggle. We're kind of like the canaries for the, for the miners, right? Because if it's happening to farm workers, it's certainly going to happen to the consuming public, right? Because that stuff doesn't, that stuff doesn't uh, come off. I would say that um, there's, I would say there's relatively little or no compliance with the law uh, going on in, in the state of Oregon. And when we attempted to, uh, to bring upon cases, uh, we had an organizing crew that was sprayed by, by, um, by a, a small um, applicator uh, plane. And we reported it to the OSHA. And they didn't send any, any uh, officers to witnesses. They didn't, they didn't do anything. So, you know, and then if you look at the current situation with uh, worker protection standards that just came out for comment, right? because we're in a comment period for the, the new EPA rigs, right? It doesn't go far enough, right? So here's another leverage that we could do to weigh in on, on, making, those, um, on making those standards uh, a lot more um, better for farm workers. But even at that, even at that, I don't, I don't believe that they're gonna, I don't, I don't, think, I don't believe um, that it's gonna be implemented. Because whatever we have in the books right now is not being implemented, right? And so um, when, you, when the law is not, is not being enforced, you know, just to give you an idea, we only have two compliance officers for the region, for the state of Washington, Idaho, and Oregon that, that is supposed to be uh, uh, looking at this, you know, under the, under the um, uh, Department of Labor. Two compliance officers for three states, covering over, over almost 800,000 workers. So, I have we have a, a real questions. I just want to end uh, this part of the conversation by saying that, in order to make change, we're going to need to do it on our own, right? That's why the work of the uh, of the Agricultural Justice Project uh, and the work that um, uh, other folks are doing is really, really important. Right, because we got to start. You know, we got to start providing education and alternatives to people. Because we got for a long time, people were saying, "Well, what's the alternative?" So we really got to uh, uh, do a lot more education. Um, so, to me, uh, I get asked a lot about, "Well, we, you guys are working on EFI, and how does that relate to um, the the work on the Agricultural Justice Project?" Right? We don't see a, we don't see a comp as a competition. We, we actually think we complement each other, right? Because any work that's being done in this area is important work, right? So there's, to, to me, I, I feel honored. I, I mean, uh, Pekun is honored to be part of uh, both projects, right? Uh, because one, is, one has a completely different, uh, uh, it has a niche that, 
that the other is not gonna is not gonna touch. The EFI is mainly concentrating on big growers. It's trying to make a more a bigger systemic change, right? But that doesn't leave the other smaller growers out, right? Because there's a lot of problems, even with the small organic growers, right? You know, it's not enough to say that, you know, I, I'm a sustainable ag grower, right? You know, because I grow locally, because I don't use pesticides, right? But when it comes to worker standards, right, or worker rights, it's out of the equation. I can take you to a dozen or more uh, local organic farms within a 10 mile radius of Portland, Oregon, who are, we know who are not paying minimum wage, who treat their workers in substandard conditions, right? And yet, they're selling sustainable ag label product at the local farmer's market. If you go there, if you go there tomorrow, you'll see those farms. And when those organizers told me, oh, do we have problems with our farmers here? I said, hell yes, you do. And I pointed it out. In fact, one of them was fined $250,000 by the US Department of Labor two years ago for wow. worker rights violations. And they're selling at, at the farmer's market under the label sustainability. So though, you know, that cannot, you know, you know, we, gotta, we gotta stop that. You know? And so that's why I say EFI is, is great. We're, we're part of that. And we're also part, we work in, 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 um, together with, with Gata. We should be doing a lot more. I think Pekun should be doing a lot more uh, in, that, in that area. Um, but we're trying to you know, shoulder our responsibility as much as we can. Um, the last thing I would say is that um, you know, we, gotta, we gotta make inroads to the retailers. And we gotta make inroads to the, to the US government. The biggest, one of the biggest buyers of of farm product in the, not only in the country, in the world, is the USDA, right? It's a candy store for, for, uh, for, for the agricultural community, right? Because they get all the sweetheart contracts, right? And, and, uh, and, and so we, you know, we gotta start convincing uh, USDA folks that they gotta, they, gotta, they gotta start buying product that is sustainable, that has front and center of the products they buy, labels like this, that uh, that respect worker rights, right? Maybe maybe uh, um, a lot of the farms that that are under this project are not unionized, but they respect the right for the workers that work at that farm to self-organize, and that's important for us. Uh, that workers have that ability to get together and and. Uh, and make a decision collectively about the future of their of their lives, of their family, and their and their children. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to complement uh, what Ramon is going to be saying because the history of the farm workers is the history of all of all of us. So we have to be aware of that, uh, and, and and how we act is very critical in terms of the times that we're going to be uh, facing. No, uh, I, I, I would I would say that the agricultural justice project and EFI is are complementary because uh, together, uh, hopefully, will set the trend, the the pace on how the food system should be. And I am saying that because uh, the issue of uh, availability of food that is healthy, that is uh, affordable, and that is uh, uh, grown in, in, uh, in a, within the context of justice for all is all encompassing. Uh, uh, people, when they are treated as a commodity, are dehumanized. And the reality is that the food system that we have today is a the hu inhuman system. Uh, it is a system, uh, to say it up front, that is based on the exploitation of the human being, is based in the, in the model of plantation, and that model of plantation is, is upholding the principles of slavery. So uh, the practical need to have food on the table Plus, and if you compare that to what is the cost of having it at the table, then and and you look the way it, the system is at this moment, 
creates the challenge that of us to be able to join forces in order to change that system. Uh, that might sound you know, kind of fuzzy, but the point is that as long as the food system that we have today is the way it is, it's not going to be the right. Children, as they grow up in, in eating food that is contaminated by pesticides, are not going to be healthy. Uh, Warren today was showing us in terms of uh, the, 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 the how the impact in the uh, intelligence level of, of children are being affected. That is the, that's the, the future for our children and the future that this food system is going to bring. That means that we need to change it. And we cannot wait to give that to our future generations for them to harm it, but as, as opposed to us assuming the responsibility of doing what it takes to change that. You see, and that's what we are facing. And in terms of my own understanding, uh, th that's the mission of Pekun, that's the mission of, of Rafi, that's the mission of Kata, that, the, 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 that to join forces so that we can move forward. And, and, and we are, personally, I am very happy that Beyond Pesticides is stepping up and taking a lead in this process because it will be, uh, <laughs> you don't know the challenges, no? But <laughs> you're gonna, <laughs> all the challenges are gonna be upfront. In, in it. So going up, um, going back to subject, I, I handed out the these two pages for you to all read them. Uh, uh, the the one page has a, a, a an action item request that I would urge you as individual and representative of your organizations to take on in order to address the issue of, of the worker protection standard by EPA. Uh, this is the just uh, policy brief that we prepare, uh, and uh, the one payer of the ask. That we, so I want you, I, I want to draw attention to that, so that uh, we can begin moving that within the context of the common period, which means that EPA is not going to change significantly what they are going to be doing, but at least we are going to generate pressure on them and initiate a public discourse about the need to change those conditions for the workers. And that's the goal that we need to have because, uh, frankly, I don't expect uh, the government, the institutions created by the government, to take the lead in changing the conditions of, of consumers, the conditions of children. Or con it is going to be by the pressure that is generated by the community, by civil society. That was why I, ha I said at the beginning that I, had the that I had this expectation in terms of the contract that we are living in. And that contract that we are living in is being, is being violated every single day that we are in, in, in assistance. And we need to change those conditions. Uh, uh, well, I don't want to take away from uh, the, the point to highlight or uh, one underlying message is that if we, acting by ourselves, we are not going to do anything. Uh, we need to act together. We need to act in a concerted manner, and we need to be intentional in the, t in the things that we are going to be doing if, if, we, if we really want to advance. Uh, the, the history has shown us that, it, that it only through those people's struggles is, the on the, is that the humanity has been able to advance in its own interest. Uh, the, in the United States, for example, the, 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 the number of unionized uh, workers is, being, uh, is going down. So how can we say that the challenge that farm workers have is to form a union when the, the majority of, of workers in the U.S. are not being unionized? So to separate one and the other is, is to be kind of confusing. We need to act together. And, and, and act together in a, in a common message that uh, sends out that we, uh, that, act, that we need all, all of us to act in a collective manner. Uh, to, to, uh, because that's the only way that we're going to be pro uh, able to advance. Uh, what other say? I, w I had a, a, a story in terms of to illustrate what would be the best protection for, work for <coughs> farm workers. And that is that it would not, they would not be exposed to pesticides. 
eh, that the alternative uh, for that is organic. Pero organic to, re, to, to uh, uh, an organic production that is not grounded in the respect of the workers is not, is, is more of the same. So we need a, a models that would work in, in, in terms of respect of the workers. And that's why we are promoting <laughs> the agricultural justice project. We are, Pecun is promoting the, uh, the, food, uh, the equitable food initiative because those are the models that will set the pace for, 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 for all of us. I'm beginning to repeat myself, so I'm going <laughs> to stop here and then <laughs> to, to, to you. Biggest 
you know, institutional buyer of food in the world. And so they were saying, where should we be putting our dollars at an institutional buying? So we went there and made sure that the standards of AJP were included in the UN's definition of fairness. And so there it is. And oddly enough, they were so much more willing and immediately got the issues of farm workers' rights, but they did not have a single section on the rights of farmers. They had no idea that farmers were under predatory contracts that had all these terrible <coughs> things going on mm -hmm. to them. It was not even on their radar. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, that's the world we live in. We're all separated and we're on our little stovepipe. So I think this message of, of breaking down these barriers between our communities and, and working across movements is, is part of where we need to go. Time for questions. Who wants to start? I guess. So you guys are talking about um, the lack of data, especially with things like uh, maybe pesticides and cancer and things like that. So I'm kind of baffled. Like you look at, um, there's a renowned agricultural school in Corvallis, right? There's a right. giant yeah. hospital here, Oregon Health and Science, just committed a billion dollars of cancer research in the two years. What's the level of engagement with institutions? Like that? I'm not saying you're not doing it, but I'm just curious as to, do they shut it down? Do they not? <coughs> Don't return phone calls. Yeah. It's a lot like asking them to do research on the health concerns of GMO. Uh, if you're taking money from big ag, which many of our land grants are forced to do because all of the cutbacks in federal support for the land grant system, so they're out there having to, you know, take money from who's going to give it to them. And it's hard to get independent research if if you're sitting there, uh, who, I don't know who the speaker was earlier today, they were talking about, uh, you know, if you're trying to be a student in weed science, if you're supported by Dow, they're giving you donuts and all of, you know, $1,000 a year. Do you want to read the study from Chamacos? That is about the, well, there, is, there are studies that are independent. So there is, there is a study underway. Is this what you're saying? It's called Chamacos. And you can read the paragraph that is highlighted? Uh, it's a longitudinal birth cohort study. I, I mm. learned today that maybe I'm a cohort, I think. <laughs> so the, the Chamaco <laughs> study is in uh, Salinas, California, okay. and it's mm -hmm. a partnership between the farm worker community there and the University of California. And what they did was recruit um, a, a group of pregnant moms, and it's been like almost 10 years now. Wow. So um, while the moms were pregnant, they measured um, pesticide uh, levels um, in the moms and then um, followed the children after they were born to make associations between their exposure to pesticides during pregnancy and what happened as the children grew up. And it has been um, an amazing study. The, I think the last two findings, um, when the kids were seven, um, they showed that the kids who had been exposed to more pesticides before birth had um, lower scores on IQ tests mm -hmm. than um, kids who had been exposed to less pesticides, and also um, a higher risk of ADHD. So Nelson. Uh, can I finish yeah. what I was going to say? And, and according to <coughs> Ann Lopez, who is a Dr. Yeah. Ann Lopez from yeah, Watsonville, yeah. the, she says that the the lowest the the lowest rate of in life expectancy in the country is in Watsonville in this area with the strawberry growers, and it's 49 years, <coughs> and it's among people who is exposed to to pesticides. And there is a video from Mexico, a documentary that is called For Those Who Don't Have Eyes, Para Los Que No Tienen Ojos. Uh, and this one shows the data in a small town that is called Fortín de las Flores. They grow flowers, and they, the woman and everyone is exposed to pesticides. And 12% of newborns are este, blind or have este, con, 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 este, defects, con or defects. A lot of different kind of defects. So it's very clear there are a lot of studies, and I think that 
I don't know. It's just they, they don't want to listen to us. Nelson, you wanted to make yeah, a comment. Right? In December, December, not early December, we uh, Beyond Pesticides met with <coughs> EPA in that famous meeting with Bradbury. Uh, it was made clear to the group that EPA's policy and commitment was towards a continuation of pesticide use, a continuation yeah. and increased use of GMOs. Uh, uh, as an institution of the government, uh, they are not going, the, the absence of a commitment towards alternative uh, ways of uh, producing food that are safer, like organics, uh, indicates that anything, any argument that will go against it, they are not going to promote it. They are not going to, to, to do it in the workshop that around it it was made, made abundantly clear that if you are a scientist and you are trying to research those subjects, you are going to be harassed and your career advances is going to commit, be, be compromised. Uh, Warren was indicating, the, the Warren suggestion, let's recruit all those scientists that are ready to, be, to retire because they will not be vulnerable to rep repercussions. Mm -hmm. They will not be able to publish and other things, no? But uh, it, it is a sad state in, to, in terms of today, that uh, when everybody knows that the, how harmful pesticides are as poison, they are not the will of the government to in, 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 in creating alternatives that are meaningful towards that. So it is not about the cost. It is not, it's, it's that there is a, a, a governmental will to, sub, to put itself at the service of, of corporations that will be promoting those, uh, those type of, uh, of food system that will not put first the health of people. And that's the reality that we are facing and that's the reality that we need to be changing. Yeah, I just want to uh, follow up by uh, talk about the local situation that you, went, you mentioned, right? It's uh, Oregon Health Science University. It's this big old building that you see up on the hill, right? And, it's, um, and so it's no uh, coincidence that that billion dollar donation the majority of came from, you know, Monsanto, DuPont, and all the other chemical companies, right? Um, we, it's not like we haven't tried. We actually have called them. We, we've, uh, we have sent people in uh, that we've, we thought uh, we had clear-cut uh, cases of pesticide exposure. We did all the things. We got the clothes. We put it in plastic. We put it in freezers. Um, we did everything and, and still to no avail. So to me, I think you're correct is, you know, um, and also what Nelson is saying is that the imperative is not there, right? Um, you know, it's always, uh, the bottom line here is economics. You know, it's, it's about, you know, we're, we're, we're messing with, um, with these big corporations that have all the power. So, you know, we gotta take them on, right? It's like eating an elephant. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take old-fashioned organizing. On the other hand, you know, let me just say that in addition to that, <clears throat> there's a, I mean, the, the struggle for, for uh, uh, against pesticide and pesticide abuse is, is really huge. It's really huge. The other thing that we did was uh, early on, and this was, I have to say, is like 15, 20 years ago, that we started, we, we brought uh, Dr. Marion Moses from San Francisco for National Pesticide Center to do training. Um, and she, well, the first thing we did was we brought all the, the health providers together. And we brought about maybe about 30 of them together from the local farm worker clinics and uh, some from the Oregon Health Sciences University, some of them from Corvallis from, uh, the, uh, from the, the School of Agriculture there, health providers. And not one of them had been officially trained. And we followed it up about 10 years ago with the same kind of questions. And our medical providers, even at the local uh, uh, farm worker clinics or migrant health clinic, are not trained to detect pesticides. So people that are exposed are uh, usually say that they have, uh, you know, it's a, a rash, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a allergies and stuff like that. And it's, you know, so, they're not, so that's, that's part of the problem, right? And then by the time it you know it goes up the chain, and then you know the we have a we have we do have a pesticide center here, 
and we do have a poison center at the Oregon Health Sciences University and they do document cases but they're not you know they're not trained and they don't want to be trained I mean they were very clear with us right I mean they couldn't have said it much clearer you know you know our our uh, our bread is buttered by the you know uh, by the people that you want to attack so what does that tell you that's loud and clear message right that we're not we're not going to change what you were referring to um, has you know a policy that we're going to continue right because you know it's uh, the the way the system is structured um, is it's all about economics it's all about money right Rao, and money and profits question. come before people do you have a question Rao? I have it's, it's more of a comment Dr. Roberts and I, and some other people you heard from, are largely epidemiologists and the customs study groups. Mm -hmm. And this is the Hanchez study and some of these other. Um, I, I was, I've been incredibly impressed the last couple of days hearing from Tirso, Nelson, and Ramon. And we had three different regions of the country where farm workers where farm workers are suffering um, <coughs> highly increased rates of cancer, uh, increased rates of fetal loss. The same things are happening. Any epidemiologist will tell you that's significant, even without better data and a real indication to get the data. Now, turning it the other way, a few years ago when I was allowed to work as an advisor to EPA before I got thrown out for complaining about what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> I got to review the, um, their strategic plan for research. And as you looked at it, all of their research was based on continuing animal testing and developing safe levels of pesticides and so on and so forth. And there was this much money to support these, this important epidemiologic type research. And I said, said to the administrator, why is it you don't want to support epidemiologic research? He says, we don't have any epidemiologists in EPA, so we don't understand epidemiology, so we can't support it. So basically they're saying, we don't want to, we don't want to look at what's happening in people. All we want to do is what's happening in rats and mice. That's all we're interested in. We're not going to support it. So there is a definite, this, I don't know what you call it, but this, there's a big jump for them to even consider in the regulatory process what's happening in people. And that resistance is just as strong now as a few years ago when I was looking at the strategic plan, even though it's obvious to anyone with 10% of a brain, and when you see the same thing happening in Florida, New Jersey, and Oregon, that there's something going on there that we need to pay attention to. That's a comment, not a question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Rob, you want to pass the mic to Tirso? Because I think he had a question. Well, I have a, a also kind of a comment. Um, additional to what Ramon says, I think you know, part of the problem is not only that the health providers are not trained. We train thousands of them, but they're not helping in, in documenting, and they're not detecting, and they're not documenting, and they're not reporting pesticide exposure incidents. We did it all over Florida. And, you know, my colleagues and my coworkers, you know, insisted that, you know, I just make judgments and I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't believe on people, but we did the work. I mean, we still getting more reports and more, um, you know, complaints by the farm workers when we train them. So we went back to the training the farm workers because that's, you know, that's producing more uh, evidence that the workers are being exposed. The other thing I want to say is also that sometimes research is happening but without of the uh, participation of farm worker organizations, it's going into our communities to do some work and to hire people and to, you know, you know, and do research. 
might not be the proper research. We all know that research is done in most of the cases with the intention to prove that there is no uh, exposure, there's no damage, there's no, you know. Uh, so <coughs> the, the communities affected have to participate, but, you know, but we have to, you know, uh, the organizations should participate. Without of us, it will be difficult to have some uh, legitimate research done that favor our communities. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not just uh, that, that we don't <laughs> believe on, on the other will. The farmers also are all instruments of the powerful uh, pesticide manufacturers and also of the government. They do work together. I have other, other comments for later. Chair, so if you could pass the mic behind sure. you. I understand this and I find it fascinating uh, because it takes me back 15 years ago when I was on submarines. And, you know, the U.S. Navy has a very vested interest in not losing submarines. Material data, hazardous waste, uh, use of materials are extremely controlled. EPA is over everything all the time. When you're in port and you're doing work, you've got inspectors walking around. I was a QA officer uh, walking through, making sure that process procedures and safety, priority one, safety were being adhered to. So these things that you're talking about that no one's allowing you to do, you know, that they're not coming out and saying, hey, we know that this causes things, they do. It's there, the information is there, but just like you're saying, it's a matter of what's the impact. They don't want to lose a submarine, they're going to make sure everybody's doing it properly. What are they losing, and, and I hate to put it in that, this callously, but from their point of view, what are they losing if they don't protect migrant workers? They'll open up the gates a little more next spring, more will come through. And that's, that's really horrible and callous, but that's kind of the view, isn't it? Uh, but where you, where that keyed me with uh, what I was, what I've done in the past is where you say you're coming up with information and building kind of records and information, it's out there. So I'd like to make contact with you and maybe show you some resources of information that's already out there, already done, and the interesting thing is the people who are overseeing and making sure that the Navy's doing what they need to do and fining them and penalizing them, sending people to jail, is the EPA. So they do regulate when it's in their interest. Well, I guess the Defense Department pays a little better. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question, and um, you know, the, the talk earlier today from the woman from the National Cancer Institute found that her study found that uh, farmers in general had a little lower rate of cancer than the general population, but a higher rate of, of certain cancers, and also that farmers are generally quite healthy people. Um, and you're saying that. The farm workers, you know, have a 25 percent higher rate and all kinds of other problems. It's a, it's and a different cohort she has. Virginia, Ohio cohorts are they're primarily the white people who are running the farms. Right. The well, that's so what I was going to ask. Is, yeah. And, yeah. and if you want to comment on that, you know, what what's the difference? Yeah, they didn't say anything about the scale of these operations. Well, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, maybe you could comment a little more on what's the difference between being a farm worker and being the kind of people that are studied in that study. I, I wasn't at the presentation, so I don't have the context for to make a comment about, you know, what, what she was talking about. But, but um, what I do know is that the majority of farm workers that, um, that mix and apply um, the chemical on the farm are mainly um, folks of color, or mainly are you know are are farm workers that do that, and um, so I I mean that's my experience um, um, on and and that's my experience in small to large farms here in the state of Oregon. So 
Um, again, I, I can't comment on it. Um, maybe if you were there, you can. No, but, but it's, it's, it's the reality, you know? The, the handlers and mixing uh, are uh, uh, farm workers. Uh, EPA is proposing a change in the rule to, to so that mixers and handlers would be 16 years old. Uh, we are going. To, we are against it because we believe it should be at least 18. Uh, and there's other things that uh, that are inherent in that in terms of training and knowing and being told what are what is that you're doing in terms of what are the type of pesticides that you need to be mixing. But in general, the the the, the practice, very few farms hire outsiders to do the the, uh, the applications. And then even those who are outsiders, from, who are not the farmer, uh, are people of color. So, so let's say the trend during the last 30 years, uh, uh, farmers have moved away from being the ones doing the application as opposed to, or the, or the mixing, uh, as opposed to having the farm workers in those. Very small farming operations that use pastures, as then the, the farmer might be doing, but those are the, very, very small farming operations. One, uh, one question and one quick comment. Uh, studies are out there. You can contact, for example, Dr. Tyrone Hayes from UC Berkeley, who's done extensive work on atrazine and was hounded by Monsanto. Uh, this was a report on Democracy Now! Amy Goodman. Uh, for years, so there is there is some work that has been done, scientific work that clearly shows the relationship between uh, a variety of ailments and and uh, strong chemical use. Question: What I, I acknowledge the fact that the economic situation is one of the keys to changing this system. It's one. What about community supported agriculture projects? How do you see those as impacting? Positively or not, uh, the idea of social justice. Well, uh, one of the the members of our agricultural justice project uh, is Liz Henderson, who really is probably the the, the remaining founder of the CSA movement and uh, tours on the issue all the time. And and certainly one of the farms we just certified in California is a CSA. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. I mean, like we were saying before, we have to have multiple strategies and we have to encourage multiple strategies. There's, not, there's, no, there's no quick fix here. We didn't get in this mess overnight. And every model that we can carry that communication through, we're, we're going to do it. We're working with a food hub in New York City. I mean, we're, you know, uh, I'm going to meet with uh, um, you know, Will Allen and uh, Look at urban agriculture. I think they're excited about this. So I mean, I think we're we're you know we're we're looking to turn over every stone because we're under this kind of dynamic where it really is up to us. And uh, you know, on the government piece, we we put legislation in that the USDA had to put three percent of their research budget into checking the risk of GMOs. Okay because there was no study going on whatsoever. And so we organized and we got 3%, all right? And we thought, okay, great. So the name of the program is called BRAG. And, it is, and what they've done so far is said, what is the risk of not doing GMOs? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, it's, it's a difficult test. Maramo, you, you wanna comment? No, no. Uh, I, I wanna just quick comment to that. Uh, among the migrant community, uh, they, the access to healthy food is very, very limited. Issues of uh, income, resources, and availability. So what we are experiencing through our work is that uh, through the food uh, gardens that we have created, others from the migrant communities are approaching us, uh, wanting to buy the products that we are producing. Uh, so that because they they want to make sure that they have access to to that healthy food, and it is in, it's a trend that is increasing uh, in terms of the the numbers of people that are approaching us about doing that. No, in terms of uh, if they are not able to uh, to hard, uh, to to produce it, but to buy it. So I just want to. to 
questions back here. I don't have a question. I have a comment, though. Um, going back to the uh, medical professionals being trained on identifying pesticides. What's happening in the Midwest, particularly in Indiana, Iowa, and Illinois, the big corn states and soybean states, big Monsanto states, the Mons Monsanto owns and operates many, many of those farms. And what they've done now is they've hired their own company doctor. And so, yes, and so now whenever a farm worker in the field becomes sick, either from pesticide exposure, it might be, they might be suffering from heat stress or, uh, you know, broken their bone or whatever, they have to go to the Monsanto company doctor. And so what this is doing is you're not able to, to identify those, those illnesses. They're hiding behind the HIPAA Act because they're not allowed by HIPAA to release any of that information. So there's yet another layer of that corporate influence here that is manipulating um, you know, the, the medical surveillance. So I had a question around immigration reform, and it seems to me that if I care about pesticides and having a broad national conversation about the harms of pesticides and movement toward organic and beyond organic and organic and food justice certified, that one of the key things I should be doing right now is fighting to stop deportations and move for comprehensive immigration reform so that the people that are most exposed have a basic level playing field and access to protection if they speak out about this. And I'm wondering if you share that, that kind of view. And if so, what sort of alliance are you seeing from um, pesticide groups or environmental groups or what are things that groups can do right now? And if you don't think that's the right intersection, why not? <coughs> Yeah, I think it's a really uh, good question. Uh, I, I part from the analysis that um, I believe that uh, immigration reform is uh, front and center uh, when we talk about pesticides and any uh, worker rights uh, issues um, that facing farm workers. Part of the solution, and I, and I wanna say part of it is the ability of a person to work uh, free from harassment, free from retaliation, uh, to live um, uh, with all the, the full protections of the law. And as long as we, we have uh, you know, 11 million people or more who are undocumented and have lived here for many years, uh, many have uh, approved immigration applications but because of our broken immigration system cannot adjust their legal status for whatever reason, um, that, you know, that, that really affects the, the ability of, of people to exercise their legal rights. And so they continue, uh, folks that are undocumented continue to live in the shadows uh, of, the, uh, of, of the justice system. And, but I, I say this because, you know, I think that um, it's a matter of when we're going to get immigration reform and how it's going to look like, because uh, I truly believe it's going to happen. Um, but the problem, I think, is the need for us to uh, continue organizing. Um, it's not only about immigration reform, but it's about worker rights. Because I had an experience that uh, we were one of the uh, organizations that benefited from the law that was passed in 1986. And I think we legalized several thousand people. <clears throat> and immediately, you know, these were all farm workers. And we benefited from the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program of IRCA. So in our, and here in the state of Oregon and Washington, all the agricultural-based state, including Florida, and, you know, they, they, uh, they benefited, we benefited from it. And we thought that the con working conditions of farm workers was gonna change once they got immigration status. And in fact, it went backwards. Because one of the things that the, uh, that the farmers did in the state of Oregon was once they got, once they, they felt like uh, once their worker, their workforce was gonna get documented, they started flooding the market with, uh, with a lot of undocumented folks. 
And so it made it difficult for people to, um, to improve their, their, their conditions at their farm. I know people that were working at a particular farm for like 10, 15, 18 years, 20 years, and never got a raise. And they were, they were, these, these folks were documented. They continued to work with pesticides. They lived in substandard conditions. And so nothing really changed for them. Only, the only thing that changed is their ability to, to either go back to their, home, their host country or their home country or bring back their families, right, in a, uh, in a legal way. But nothing really changed. That's why it's really important for us to do this kind of work that we're doing. That's why the work that Tirso's doing in Florida, that uh, Nelson's doing in, in New Jersey and other states is really important work because it's not only about immigration reform, but it's about building uh, uh, organization that addresses not only their immigration status, but their, um, their status as human beings. I think uh, Nelson pointed out, you know, concretely, is that this is about human rights. This is, uh, this is about the ability of people uh, that can, can determine, you know, their own destiny and the destiny of their, of their family and their children. And to do that, it's not only about immigration, but it's about empowering those workers so that they can make a difference in their lives. And that's what their organizations, I had the, I've had the opportunity to go to Florida and to New Jersey with, with Nelson, and I've seen the work that they're doing. I've seen the work that Kata's doing and that the Florida Association doing. And it inspires Pekun to do that kind of work, right? To, to organize workers, right? And that's why we're, our organization is not only about, uh, is not only a, a labor union. Um, in fact, I think uh, we're a lot different from, uh, from a labor union. What we've done basically is got a page of the old labor movement back in the 20s and 30s and created a labor community union, right? Where we have more membership under associated membership than we do under <coughs> union contract. Um, and what we, what we do is, um, is we're building uh, union members um, and we're, um, we're addressing their needs. So we provide services, we provide, uh, we provide their children with uh, education, with housing. That's why we're involved in housing because we, um, we know that they're vulnerable when they live in labor camps. And labor camps is a, is a, is a form of apartheid. And I'll tell you, apartheid is alive and well in the state of Oregon, right? I believe that conditions in Oregon are worse than Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and half of the other uh, uh, states in the South, right? We have apartheid here. And what I mean by that is that workers are still indentured, right? Florida has, uh, Florida has documented legalized slavery, indentured servitude in the state of Florida. Well, we have that here in Oregon. We just want our first uh, um, a trafficking case of a, of a farm worker uh, who was working construction. The first, um, first trafficking case, you know, human slavery in the state of Oregon. People that are picking our food that we're gonna eat in, a, in about 15 minutes, right? And, 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 and these people are treated like slave, under slave conditions. That's what's happening here in the state of Oregon. So to me, that's why it's important that we all, in addition to stopping the madness around pesticides, that we support these community organizations, right? And that we support the effort to win comprehensive immigration reform that is just, right? That's why it's important that we fight back against uh, the introduction of bringing uh, um, um, millions of, of farm workers or hundreds of thousands of farm workers under the old Bracero program, right? Because we want, People that are, are going to come here, we're not against people coming here, but as, as long as they're treated with respect and dignity, and they have the same rights that every other worker has in, in, uh, in the U.S., because if they don't have those rights, then they undermine the rights of everybody else. So that's what we're all about. We're all, we're all about winning comprehensive immigration reform with meaningful uh, worker rights standards in them, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work for us. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna uh, you know we're gonna have the same system. You know, if you're a, if you have a brother and sister from the Philippines, you have to wait 35 years to be reunited with your siblings. If you're from Mexico, it's 20 years. If you're from India, forget it, right? So our immigration system is broken, and we got to do something about it. 
Thank you. Yeah, immigration reform, uh, especially the way some, some other parties want it, is not going to solve the problem. Uh, organizing the community have to continue, uh, you know, for them to be involved in coming up with a more sustainable farm worker workforce, importing the workers, uh, you know, under the, the uh, uh, guest worker programs is not going to be uh, a permanent good solution because not even, I mean, there are some people working on that and we don't have enough people to keep on importing them from Mexico. Uh, you know, we hear that already. Um, I just want to say that, uh, well, the, I just want to do a little bit of advertisement. Next year, when we have the meeting in Florida, you're going to see for, uh, firsthand if it's going to be an Apopka, yeah. the history of the Lake Apopka, the largest lake polluted by some family farmers. Some of these family farmers are corporate farmers. They're called family farmers, but they're huge corporations with investments all over the world. And uh, I mean, they had destroyed the lake, destroyed the species there, and we never were able to get, they studied the species, and they find out that they end up the species, but they never had done anything in the farm worker community to, to you know, our people were exposed to the same chemicals before we had regulations and after we had regulations, uh, and, and have some real bad effects, but never have been done. And it was not because we didn't try. We also had some other very bad experiences there. It was a chemical done, uh, manufactured by DuPont, which is based in Florida and Jacksonville. And uh, our workers were exposed as well as the farmers. And uh, have affected the crops in a real bad way. They pay damage on the crops. And uh, you know the, our people were very badly affected. We never had been able to for them to do anything related to that. And then can keep going on and on. And we had done some studies, some good studies. Uh, also, we're doing some work on coming out with alternatives. And uh, we're doing community farms and the farm market communities, trying to deal with. Is, we're, we should not just work to secure food for people outside our communities, but also to secure good, healthy, local, better food for our community. Because that's not going to, that's not solve, we're not going to solve the problem. Our people also have the right to have good, fresh, nutritious, uh, 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 non-chemical, uh, produced food, uh, culturally appropriate for them. It's a difference between food security and food sovereignty. We're trying to get into the uh, more full solution of food sovereignty. It's actually dinner time. <laughs> National Forest Service, State Forest Service, there's no data that says what goats do. None. Their shells are loaded with pesticides and herbicides and how much should we use and there's no data. And when I try to get somebody to do research project, even I'll do it, anybody will do it. Um, there's no money. They say, okay, I have to fund it. And then it's too hard to measure wellness. It's too oh. hard to measure wellness yeah. of the land. Because reduction of science, you take out the one thing, which is how much herbicide, then we measure yes, We measure that, and it's it's a different way to measure, and they, you know, blow out the science, and then just one more thing, Nelson, to make you feel better about the Puerto Ricans that went home with their fancy suits, <laughs> is there was a cook on the ranch my dad grew up on, and she was a German woman. After the war, some of the soldiers told the beautiful <coughs> young German girls that when they were back in the U.S., they were very rich, so they married them and then came home. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to give a huge thank you to our panelists. And um, invite you all to continue this conversation while enjoying the fruits of some hard labor. <laughs>